All right. So welcome everybody. I'm glad to uh, see you today at our event in the international series of online research software events. And yeah, I will start with a few um, introductory words um, to highlight first to highlight our next source event. So th this will actually be the final source event since our call for contributions closed. So in case you're interested, see you can still see our upcoming events here on the source webpage. And the agenda for today is actually so. I'm uh, Florian, who is also part of the source organizers. He will give a talk about Wikidata as a research tool for data modeling and integration with the humanities. And I will afterwards give a talk about a distributed data analysis framework that we develop here in our research center and in our, um, yeah, whatever. And afterwards, Florian Thiel will again give a talk um, on Little Minions in archaeology. Um, so I kindly ask you to adhere to our code of conduct that you can also see on our web page. Um, as a side note, the event will be recorded. So, um, and it will be published online. Um, so if you do not want to be recorded, um, please mute your microphone and turn your video off. You should anyway mute your microphone, please, during the talk, unless you have a question. And um, if you want to ask questions without being recorded, please use the Zoom chat because we will not um, keep that for the recording later. So I will now hand over to Florian, Thierry, Sophie, and Jakob. Uh, Thierry. Um, who will start with the first talk about Wikidata as a research tool for data modeling and integration in the humanities uh, with examples from German Wikimedia, the Fellow program Free Knowledge. Thanks. So, floor is yours, Jakob. Yeah, thanks and welcome. So, um, yeah, the project you want to show out how to use Wikidata, both origin from the German Wikimedia Fellow Program Free Knowledge. And this is the program is going on for some years. We fund and, and help young scholars and um, in this round. So I'm the mentor for both Sophie and Florian. And the fourth of us, and last but not least, is a unofficial um OSCE fund responsible for the fellows that was invented by uh, a group of fellows so they um are very engaged um within the pro program uh yeah we want uh, wikimedia uh, germany wants to promote free knowledge in general but in particular academia and um, the exchange between society and academia so what's uh, this one part of what's called open science and the program is also very interdisciplinary. So uh, we try to get people from different cultures and engage in networking. And yeah, but the, the, the general um, topic is open science. And this is also a very broad topic. So it um, subsumes methods and access and open access. And in, in the project that we want to show uh, today, uh, the first focus is on open data, so that's the one part of open science, and we will explain why data is uh, so important in this case. But um, the program and open science in general also includes uh, things like knowledge equity, citizen science, and so on. Okay, but this, uh, this talk is not about open science, so it's uh, about uh, open data, for the first focus. And the second photo focus is um, a networking. And um, here we have one example that was already shown in, in a recent Sorcer, um event. So the um, fellows funded research school engineers group. And you're all welcome if you are doing some science with data and the humanities, uh, then feel free to join and um, you can get interesting tips and so on. Okay, so data and networking. I'll get back to data. So why is data so important? 
in this uh, scenario. So it's not enough to just publish uh, your findings and say, yeah, we have found some data. But uh, nowadays, you are expected to do um, your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So this um, known under the FAIR label. So other people can reuse your data or find it in the first place. So you have to know about data creation, data publication, and management skills. Um, but this is also rewarding um, even more than the research software or it's a part of the research software because the software can be replaced and evolves um, and the data can be used in, with uh, multiple uh, kind of software. So there's this proverb data matches like wine and applications age like fish. And that's um, uh, so even more important to uh, take care of your data management. And one uh, technology to, uh, to help to do so is a linked data, or if you might make it open, linked open data. So the basic idea of linked data is to split your data into very atomic parts. And each part is a, known as a statement. So it consists of subject, predicate, object. So to say that something has a specific property or is linked in a specific way to some other thing. And if you have a uh, big database and you get a lot of linked data, so-called triples or statements, and these can be published and better be reused. And <clears throat> this linked data principle uh, works like this. So um, you use uh, identifiers, um, URIs, to identify things and objects and findings and make these URIs accessible via HTTP. And so you put your data as linked open data as resource on the web. And then this data can be linked with other data and other people or other projects can connect to it. And um, so it's uh, more and more evolving and, and getting more and more connected and bigger and bigger. <clears throat> and this is already done since uh, more than a decade. And so we get a, a so-called knowledge graph of uh, multiple uh, databases that are connected to each other and one uh, dot here, one hub of connections of data within the linked open data world is a uh, Wikidata. You can see in, in the center WD, WD. and um, there are a lot of databases from different domains. For instance, here in yellow, the life sciences that are connected uh, among each other, but also uh, via different hubs to Wikidata. And if you have uh, data, then it makes sense to connect it to this, uh, this graph too. And this can be done very good by connecting to Wikidata. Yeah, so let me briefly explain Wikidata. So Wikidata would be worth a whole um, tutorial, but there are other, um, other ways to, to, to in give introductions on the web. Um, and uh, I can only stress that it, it makes, it, it's worth to, to try out Wikidata and do something simple with it, because I think in the future you can't avoid um, ignoring it. So what's Wikidata? It's a free and open knowledge base. And it's a data hub, so data hub connecting everything. But it's not like a commercial uh, way, database. It's free and it can be reused. And it's a wiki, so everybody can edit and, and change and, and improve it, like uh, known from the Wikipedia. Um, the Wikidata database was first um, implemented as a central storage for the Wikimedia project, so for Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons image database and other projects. Um, but nowadays, it's more and more used independently. Uh, so the, the important point, it's available in the free license, CC0, so you don't, don't have to take care about um, some uh, license issues. It's multilingual, so if you have to, a connection to an object in Wikidata, then you likely get the names of the object in uh, up to 200 languages. Um, it's accessible both to machines and humans, so you can write um, your applications that take data from Wikidata and, and modify it or connect it to your other um, data, you can export it and yeah, interlink it um, uh, to make it part of this linked data cloud. This is just a, a glimpse um, of Wikidata, but what's, uh, this is what, what's important to, to this uh, use cases um, now. And there are several tools. So uh, finally coming to research software, 
So there are several tools to uh, put data, import data into the Wikidata database. So one is Open Refined, and the other is a Quick Statements. But uh, with the API, a lot of people have coded their own little tools for uh, specific use cases. And um, then you can, yeah, your domain-specific research uh, data easily connect to Wikidata. And how is this done, or two examples, will be shown now, starting uh, with Lurian. So uh, I hope you can see my screen right now. Um, yeah. Um, as uh, Jacob said, uh, we will present now two use cases, uh, how we um, implemented Wikidata um, in our Open Science Fellows Program um, projects. And um, one project, it's my project, it's a project on Ohmstones, and the other project is a project uh, of Sophie, it's on Smash Dishes. Um, and it's both of them are kind of uh, archaeology related. And yeah, I will talk now about my uh, Ohmstones project, uh, or it's called Irish Ohmstones in the Wikimedia universe. And you can explore it uh, under that link. And there's a little description of the project and uh, what I want to do and so on. But uh, yeah, the main topic of that um, project uh, are Ohmstones. And these are, yeah, medieval stones, uh, which were, yeah, created or somehow um, there were inscriptions on it and it's uh, from the 4th to the 6th century AD and they are distributed all over Ireland, Wales, England and the Isle of Man. Um, and uh, as you all know, uh, not all databases bases are online and just a few of them are openly available and accessible and even less a part of the Link Open Data Cloud as well as Wikidata and so on. Um, so, uh, what, do we, what can we do if we want to look at all ohm stones from Ireland? And so, where can we find them? There are several sources and possibilities. One of them is, of course, offline. You can uh, have a look in books like McAllister um, or other publications. There are several online databases, mostly from the 1990s, like the CISP database. There are online and open uh, projects and databases like the 3 d Ohm project database or the Heritage, Heritage Management WebGIS system, but there's nothing about linked Ohm uh, data in the uh, semantic web. So if we want to create uh, linked Ohm uh, stones in the semantic web, there are several possibilities to host and publish this data. And as Jacob said before, one of the possibilities could be Wikidata. And uh, yeah, Wikidata is a data hub and also allows for community work and therefore for citizen science. So maybe we can use swarm intelligence for that, that we do not model everything uh, on our own and can use the huge Wikidata community. And for that, we uh, yeah, established some kind of workflow. Uh, it's called here the Wikidata own workflow. We start from several sources like books, databases, and so on, and extract information on this uh, stones like the fine spot, mostly a townland, and material words, inscriptions, and so on. Um, a link this to existing information, for example, um, uh, geospatially to OpenStreetMap, input that data into Wikidata and link that information into uh, or inside Wikidata. Um, so we can then extract enriched data with the help of a so-called Sparkle Unicorn to do further analysis with open source software like QGIS or R or whatever. And one of the items which we can put into Wikidata are so-called formula words. Um, so words that describe some kind of relations uh, between persons uh, in the, this inscriptions. So for example, um, if we have the word maki, which means sun, or there is another word, uh, famous word, it's mokoi, it's some kind of relation between a tribe and so on. And 
Here you can see some of the inscriptions on that stones and uh, there were various uh, relations that you could do um, if you have all of that data and uh, network of persons or network of tribes um, and you can do some further analysis on that, which could be, would be cool. Um, and as always in archaeology, there are sites and find spots and we can also model that uh, in Wikidata. And here on the right side, you can see uh, the um, current townlands from the McAllister book, uh, which are spread all over Ireland. And uh, yeah, we, we, as I said before, we will link it to uh, OpenStreetMap and um, Logaim IE. Uh, it's another famous um, reference for uh, places in Ireland. And uh, yeah, the, the whole Wikidata modeling of an ohm stone could be some kind of complex. And right now we decided to do it like that. So that an ohm stone is an uh, instance of an ohm stone. It's part of uh, an ohm stone collection, uh, part of a project. Then we uh, um, have a reference to the country, the um, find spots of the coordinate lo location. Uh, we will we'll also show the inscription, some kind of serial number of the different publications, the material that was used, some, for example, uh, sandstone or whatever, the dimensions, the inscription uh, which is mentioned, and the state of conversation, and if possible, an image which is hopefully inside Wikimedia Commons in, in the Wikimedia universe. And we do also, uh, as you can see here in green, um, uh, a linking to other resources. Um, so because we want to use Wikidata as a linked open data hub and the some kind of own network to link all of this different numbering system, different publication system together and uh, use the uh, Wikidata community in citizen science to improve all of that data. And uh, how we do that in Wikidata, we uh, do also a link to uh, a database which is not Wikidata, which is uh, available under own.link. Um, so an exact match so that we have a bidirectional link uh, to um, several other databases. And uh, we also uh, map other stones inside Wikidata together. So for example, the McAllister numbers to the CISP numbers and the own 3D numbers that we um, can create an own stone network inside Wikidata. And th this is a short example of a CIC 81, um, one stone from McAllister, um, how we modeled that in Wikidata. And you can see here yeah, we have a coordinate, the material that is used is a stone. It's a part of the collection. It's part of the stone corridor in, at the University College in Cork. Uh, where are several other stones and if we can do it, uh, just visit it, uh, visit them, it's really, really cool. Um, then we have the location of discovery, some uh, dimensions like the length, the height, the width, and uh, yeah, the inscription on this stone um, and um, the words like Maki and Mokoi, as I said before, uh, that are mentioned on this on, in, uh, inscription. And with Wikidata, you can easily do some uh, kind of mapping, um, as you can see here. Um, and yeah, that could is a very, very cool thing. And uh, if we have that data into Wikidata, as I said before, we can do some further analysis like uh, geospatial uh, statistics or statistical uh, analysis on words. And yeah, you can um, yeah do some research uh, with that open data. And now we'll hand over to uh, Sophie, who will present the, her project. Thank you, Florian. I just start sharing my screen. Let's have a look whether this works. Great. I will talk about um, smash dishes. And the aim of my project is to um, 
put archaeological sources into the key data. This didn't just look as I wanted it to. Come on. Full screen. It worked when I tried it beforehand. It doesn't. Oh, okay. Mm. Here we go. So, oh, come on. Here we go. Um, in pop culture, archaeology is usually, usually depicted in some kind of Indiana Jones, Lara Croft way. So, we go in, take the loot, destroy the temple, and leave again, which is not quite something that happens in real life. And um, I came to the topic, or more or less to the name of my project via Indiana Goo, which is, as we all know, uh, the Disney version of Indiana Jones. And um, in one story, he finds uh, an archaeological site, picks up some finds, looks at them, and proclaims, oh no, how boring, it's just smash dishes. Which is just not something anyone who is really not into archaeology would ever say. Because smash dishes are just one of the really main sources we have in archaeology to reconstruct the lives of the ancient peoples. So especially in the time I work in, which is like 7,000 years ago, uh, we don't have any written information. We only have broken dishes. We have stone tools that are quite often broken as well, and um, different col colors in the soil, which is something you really need to train to be able to analyze. Um, but in all these, in this group, they are the broken dishes are really one of the most important sources because we can use them as cultural markers, which means uh, we can date an assemblage of finds, like a group of finds found in the same place via the shirts, via the broken dishes, um, because they, they change during time. So um, your grandma's teacup looks different than your teacup. And because we know this for the times before, we can date uh, assemblages via these shirts. A lot of these shirts and broken dishes are found uh, on agricultural, uh, agricultural areas like fields. And um, it's actually a little bit of a problem for us archaeologists because there is a lot of agricultural area and a lot of fields and a lot of time. The last 7,000 years are a long time. And so there are many archaeological sites which we archaeologists just don't manage to survey regularly. So we can't walk over these fields uh, and we can't find old sites just by ourselves. So heritage management and archaeology in general is very um, thankful to volunteer archaeologists who do citizen science by yeah, walking over fields, picking up finds, and reporting them to heritage management and to the local authorities. Uh, so we find new sites and we find new finds from already known sites. So what happens then with these finds heritage um, that, that are found by like um, citizen archaeologists? Usually they pick it up, they bring them to the heritage management, to the local authorities, they do the analysis and the dating, and um, they, re they record the information in their own databases. And then, at least in Germany, it's, it's usually the case they give it back to the uh, citizen archaeologist and say, give them all the information as well and tell them, hey, this is a great shirt. Thank you very much. It dates from 5000 BC, whatever. Um, but there is, in my opinion, a little bit something missing. Um, even though heritage management usually um, kind of celebrates the work the citizen archaeologists do, it's always done in a rather small scale. So there's maybe once a year a little conference where people come together and talk about what they found. And uh, sometimes if it's something exceptional, there may be a little publication uh, in a journal where someone might be able to present what he or she found on, in the fields. But it's there's no platform for the citizen archaeologists to be able to share their on their own what they found. So they have Facebook groups and um, forums, but it's um, not in a structured way. So I thought it would be a cool idea to have a platform where they can show their work and their contribution to archaeology. 
they can also share the information they have gained with others, get some online recognition. And, and that's of course something that's very interesting for me as archeologist, they can enable others to use the information. So others meaning archeologists, other citizen archeologists, uh, just the interested public, whatever. Now enter Wikimedia and my project. So my idea was that I uh, model in Wikidata a way to um, gather archeological data and to especially shirts, archeological shirts, because that's what this is about. Um, and then train citizen archeologists how to publish photos in the Wikimedia Commons of their finds and how to enter the information the in a structured way into Wikidata. So others can use this, other citizen archeologists, students, other scientists, really anyone interested. And by linking this to the Wikipedia, it really is um, a way to, um, to publish openly and accessibly uh, what they've done and get some recognition online as well. And I think um, the Wikimedia universe is a, a very good choice for, to, for doing that because it's large and it's stable, so it doesn't really depend on me uh, upholding some kind of infrastructure, but it's there already. And by Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons, it's just very well known already. So, of course, there are a few things I need to be careful about. Um, one of the main points that was um, uh, told to me by, by a heritage man manager, he said, well, you need to be careful uh, because we don't want to encourage grave diggers. So please only give imprecise locations of a size. So we don't want to record the GPS location. But if we use the local subdistrict, that's fine for most archaeologists. Because um, if I do a really detailed study of uh, sites and uh, find spots in a certain area, I will need to go to the heritage management anyway and get the real detailed information there. But um, if I just want to map a distribution of fines in, in, let's say, one German state, it really zooms out anyway, and the information of the local subdistrict is way enough. And then I could use the Wikidata data. We need to, of course, be careful because citizen archaeologists may make errors. And uh, they are actually a quite uh, self critical crowd. <laughs> And they say, well, yes, of course, I, I know in a certain area, I know a lot about my finds and I can analyze them very well myself, but in other, other areas and other finds I find I might not be able to do that. So there are two ways to um, kind of work with that. Either we say, hey, it's crowdsourced knowledge, so people, other people will correct the glaring mistakes at least. And the other way would be, well, we just enter the finds after the information from the heritage management arrives. And one point that has been, um, uh, given to me by the uh, citizen archaeologists, they say, well, it's, it's really difficult for us to, to work online and digitally because we are just not very digital native. So um, we need to, or I need to create an easy to follow workflow. And there are tools in Wikidata to do that. The Cradle tool is uh, very good for that. It creates, uh, or I can create, can create formula there where they can just um, enter um, very specific fields which I designed beforehand. And my aim is also to create open educa educational resources that uh, everyone who wants to work with this uh, can revisit anytime. And um, yeah, if they've forgotten some kind of step in the workflow, they can just look it up again. So let's conclude. What, why should we use Wikidata for citizen science projects and for archeological data? Wikidata enhances data reusability and availability as it is just embedded into the linked open data cloud and it's um, embedded into the whole Wikimedia universe, which is just very well known already. It um, gives the data uh, to the public in a fair way, which is, means the data is findable, it's accessible, it's interoperable, and it's reusable. There are possibilities for data integration between diverse data sources and to research software. And as I said, the Wikimedia universe is just very well known already and uh, people already go there to get information. And by using tools like Cradle, it's easy to use for citizen scientists. And for research software en engineers, it's just, it, it's just a very uh, interesting and important tool as well. 
because um, the data and software integration and the linked open data um, and the interoperability um, opens up really new possibilities for the community. So uh, if you're interested in digital heritage management and um, linked open data, you are very welcome to join the research school engineers. And uh, if you say, well, maybe I'm not so archaeologically interested or not so into DH, um, digital humanities, or maybe just have a look at other Wikimedia projects because there are a number and not all of them are in digital humanities, but in other areas of science as well. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and we are looking forward to questions. Thank you very much, Jakob, Florian and Sophie. Are there any questions? You can also use the chat if you want. There is a question by Logan Zween. Uh, you may already know this, but this kind of citizen science platforms are fairly common in citizen ecology, in particular ornithology. Maybe these could give some inspiration and then she sends a link. Um, oh, that's great. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, uh, you I, can I also, if you, do you want to say something, Lawrence, as you turned on your video? Um, yeah, well, basically this, uh, so it's not really a question. Um, I happen to have helped design one of these things in a previous life. Um, and um, yeah, so these are also communities of citizen scientists who are uh, interested in this, um, who sometimes think that they have seen a very rare bird, uh, which turns out to be misidentified and was actually quite a bit more common. Um, so these platforms also have experts that help in identifying species. If you uh, put in an observation that is somehow special, somebody will go and contact you and say, hey, did you take a picture? Because uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And um, in the Netherlands now, this information is uh, all collected in a single database and also used by the government, for instance, um, because they have to take into account uh, protected species if they want to uh, wait for permitting processes and anything else that happens in the landscape. Um, so yeah, of course it's a different field, um, but it might be of inspiration. I think that some of the social processes around it, why, why do people volunteer to do this? That those may be quite similar. Um, I have no opinion on, on Wikidata as a, as a platform for this. Uh, I don't know enough about it to, uh, to say. Thank you. Do you want to comment on this? Yeah, thanks. It's a great idea to look at ornithology because I think you're right. It's a big field for citizen scientists as well. And uh, they might have some um, approaches that might be useful for archaeology. I have a look. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Question about Wikidata. If it is a wiki, how persistent of a data set assured and that it is not altered by others, especially if I publish a scientific data set connected to a publication? Well, best practice is to, to publish your data in a, a data repository and then connect it to Wikidata or import parts of it um, to Wikidata. And sure, it can be uh, modified, but uh, most likely modifications are improvements or take place in areas that have not been covered by your data set. And it, that's the way I do it in the own project. So I will have on the one hand the data in Wikidata and on the other hand in my own triple store. And I'll just, uh, yeah, do a bi-directional link together that I have my, yeah, my, my own expert data and maybe use hopefully the uh, uh, ex extensions, uh, the community made in Wikidata. Um, and if they are cool and nice and helpful, I will just put it into my own database. So it's, I think that's the way you can handle that kind of problem. Thank you very much. There is another hint so to say to Sophie, uh, for archaeological finds, there is also another project in the Netherlands and you find the link in the chat. Yeah, thanks. I have contact to them and there's a European network um, as well to whom I talked and uh, they're doing cool stuff. Um, 
but I didn't want to create my own uh, website where people put up the stuff. So um, using Wikidata was just because I'm a small one month project, um, the easier solution. Okay. And I have a question, a quick question uh, to Gloria, maybe. Um, how difficult was it actually to link the data to all these other resources that are already in Wikidata? So I never used Wikidata before or put anything in there. So, but if I, for example, so should we, I mean, there are already discipline specific um, databases existent for uh, for climate proxies, for instance, we have Neotoma. So should they all go into Wikidata instead of making their own platform and database? Um, I think, um, as I said before, Wikidata could be an extension for uh, yeah, the community uh, and uh, cannot replace your own database because yeah, you have your data sovereignty on that. So it's for me, it's more kind of extension. And um, yeah, it's sometimes it's, it's hard. It really depends on the topic you want to link. So if you just think geospatially, it's some kind of easy, but uh, not really, because uh, uh, for instance, all the um, townlands, some of them are into Wikidata, some of them not. So um, yeah, but that's in, in this case, it's your job just to put them in because then the Wikidata cloud just proves and everything is fine. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, it, you cannot just profit from it. You have to give input and that's uh, the main thing. Thank you very much. We have a last question by Sven van der Borg and then we will continue with the next talk. Sorry, I, I, <laughs> I just enabled my video. I really don't have a question. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's fine. So you just want to appear in the recording. Okay, um, yeah, then, well, shall I just continue? <laughs> or Florian, please. Um, uh, should, should I um, hand over and uh, just give you the screen of your presentation or? Well, I can also do it myself, that's okay. fine. <laughs> All right. Um, then let me share my screen again. So because this time is uh, quite unusual, but um, we have uh, this time we have um, presenters from our source committee to present us, so we don't have an explicit external host. Uh, so I will now give a talk about a new distribute, uh, distributed data analysis framework for better scientific collaborations that we develop that, uh, as part of the data hub and uh, data hub initiative within the Helmholtz Fed, um, yeah, HGF Helmholtz Gesellschaft für Forschung. It's a German um, wide um, yeah, research collaboration, sorry. So there are several institutes uh, involved here and several colleagues from these institutes have been contributed to this work and to this idea behind it. Um, myself, I am located in the Helmholtz Centrum Geestacht, um, but we have people from the Geoforschungszentrum um, in Potsdam and we have from Avi, Jülich, and all kind of, but this is not German related. The idea here that I want to present you today and the framework is actually um, a pretty generic one. So in our initiative, we're um, in our collaboration, we thought about what are challenging problems for distributed data analysis. So when we have, um, and that means, of course, first of all, what is distributed data analysis? And I will show you, started with a small example. So we have a two uh, campaign between um, one research center, EOMAR, and another research center, the HZG, for instance, and we both have two ships, right? They are going on the, uh, on the ocean and they measure real-time data during a campaign. So 
the zone the ship from Geoma then of course sends the data to the internal area of Geoma and the ship from HZG sends everything to the HZG. And then the question is how can people from HZG access and analyze the data at the Geoma? As this was a campaign, a joint campaign between two research institutes, the collaboration should go further and not only during the time of measurement in that sense. Then another, uh, example would be model simulation. So if I have a climate model here at the Hatzel scheme and um, we need, um, we want to compare with output of a ocean model at the Geomar. So, and then ideally also with the ship measurements. So the, these are then terabytes of data that we want to share them. And also we need to make sure that we always get the latest versions because you change um, input parameters in your model simulation and so on. So you want to keep your colleagues up to date. And so what I'm talking about here is, it's about analyzing distributed data. So we have data in one research center and in another research center. And how can we combine this data the easiest way in that sense, right? And the ideal world, of course, we have all one single big data cloud and we run simulations in this cloud and store real, near real-time data in this cloud and then do all the post-processing and data analysis in this cloud. And then if someone from HZG needs access to data from Geomar, well, I just grant it, right? I just say, okay, give it, give it to him. But in the real world, it's not that way. So every each and every research center has center has its own um, software solutions for data analysis. They have different clusters. Each cluster is behind a VPN or a firewall, and um, they usually don't usually don't have access uh, to this cluster. So if someone from HZG needs data from Geoma, then well, we have to put it on a platform where you can share it for. Dropbox and FTP server or whatever. So this then hinders the collaboration between the different research institutes. And um, so as we do it, as we do not have a cloud, the question is, can we find something that we can get access to data in another research center and to get access or on a server that we actually don't have access to and can we get access to computing power in another research center and of course it must be safe and it must be easy for the scientists but uh, we were not the first one with this idea basically so the people from digital earth which is another um, initiative within the hgf um they already also thought about it so they had a web front end basically um where they want to visualize data and then they have a back end module that is developed by the scientists um, where he implements some data analysis routines and they both com communicate through such a massive probe if you're an Apache Pulsar in this case. Um, so this then sends the front end sends a message to the Pulsar, he forwards it to the back end, and uh, then also the response gets back. Um, so the idea for us was, well, why don't we do this for Python? Why Python? Because Python is a very well established um, language for our researchers. So the scientists, many scientists use this language. And so instead we just replace the web front end here by a Python interface in that sense. And then we can automate it more. So in, in the end, you can kind of see the way as the most popular messaging frame, um, messenger framework Signal uh, where you have, for example, if Helmut wants to send a message to Gerda, it does not go directly to Gerda, it goes to a signal server here, forwards the message to Gerda, and then Gerda receives the message. And then Gerda, of course, wants to send a response, so she doesn't directly send it to Helmut's phone, it goes again via the signal server, and then this forwards it to Helmut. So we just replaced the signal server here by our 
And Petri Pulsar, Helmut is our scientist, and then Gerda is our backend module. So the scientist sends a request, gets to the message broker, this receives the request, and then sends the response through the Pulsar again back to the scientist. And if you want, this is a remote procedure call, how you would normally call it. So you have a client stub, which is our scientist, and a server stub, which is our backend module. The advantages are pretty clear. So the scientist can simply send a request and re retrieve the response on any other machine. And the backend module can run everywhere. It does not need to be a dedicated web server. It can also be on our supercomputing cluster. The disadvantages here are, however, that scientists are not familiar with web requests. and also, as our backend module developers are scientists as well, they are neither. So the request also then needs to be serialized into a form that can be sent over via the web. So usually in a JSON compatible format. And then of course, this might be a potential vulnerability for internal computing resources. And well, Unfortunately, scientists do have better stuff to do than implementing um, these frameworks. So I want uh, our aim was basically to develop something that is easy to use, right? So that all the complexity in this messaging framework is hidden behind the scene. And that's what we do. We want to be nice and do not want to add more work to the um, scientist workflow in that sense, right? We want to use the scientist method. So our framework takes a function like this here, a standard Python function. Here we use an X-ray data array, but it can be anything else. And then this gets abstracted um, into a, uh, into a um, Pydantic model, if you want. And um, then the client stuff is um, automatically generated. So every, actually, all that the scientist has to, care, has to care about is write this small function here, because all the rest is um, then abstracted and standardized following well-known um, schema information. So, and this um, API that basically then transforms for the client stuff the, quest, uh, the request into JSON is also automatically generated. But I will quickly show that in live demo. Um, whoop. One second. It doesn't go down. Here we are. So this is just a basic example of how that works. So we saw this function here just before, right? So you import our messaging framework here, and then you just write that into a Python file. Then this automatically generates, um, this is derived from this here, basically this generates a command line interface that you can use, and then you can use this command line to attach the backend module to the Apache pullbar, pulsar. The client stub, which you would then generate a gift to your colleague can be uh, at the other research institute can be created automatically. So you just run this generate command. It takes the information from the backend module and generates your client API. So we can store that as a Python file, and then we can um, here use this here in a Python script, for instance. So we just import the Python file as we usually do. We create our Python object here, in this case, an Excel data array, and then it is sent over the internet to the Pulsar, as you see here, and this then also forwards the request back. And in the end, the user doesn't really know whether he's now computing on the um, API or uh, on the client stuff or the server stuff because 
the API is exactly the same. And then we can also, of course, yeah, use different different data formats in this sense, right? Here I use a larger data file on my local hard disk, and then I just send it also send it to the client disk so it gets serialized and then compute it on the client uh, on the server stuff, and then I'm getting the response. Let me quickly check the time. Okay. Um, so in summary. What we develop here is a remote procedure call uh, with a high level API to easily create server and client stops. Um, and this is very close to the scientist common workflows. Um, in the future, we still need to put more effort into uh, security so to make a user management for backends and to also add end to end en encryption. And also there's still a bit of a question how to best handle large amounts of data because it wouldn't make sense to send like gigabytes of data through the pulsar and then send it to the client stuff. And yeah, if you are interested in that framework, I'm happy for collaboration. It's still closed source, but um, we will open it up soon, hopefully. So if you're interested, just get in touch. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, uh, thank you, Philip. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, uh, yeah, just ask, please, write in the chat or just unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, I'm, my name is Gareth Jones, and I work at the University of Bristol as an RSE. Uh, and I'm working on a project called OpenGHG, which is doing something relatively similar with atmospheric um, chemistry or well, atmospheric gas measurements. Um, and we're going down more the route of using serverless functions and sort of JupyterHub instances to do something like this. But I, I really like the idea of sort of allowing people to just do um you know do the, the, the standard workflow they have um and send that to you know sort of higher level compute resources through something like apache um pulsar which isn't something i've come across before um but yeah i think it's yeah it's a very it's a cool project and, and i can see sort of similarities to what the kind of thing we'd like to do so maybe yeah if i could send you an email at some point we could have a chat that'd be really good um sort of see sort of the same things that you've bumped into um, similar to things like, you know, sending large amounts of data um, and yeah, just trying to get the workflow of scientists so they don't say, oh, why would I have to do this? Because I'm doing something like this already, you know, sort of try and seamlessly replace what they're trying to do with something that well, we think is superior um, and allow them to use sort of cloud compute resources and things. Um, but yeah, no, it looks like a really cool project. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sounds, that's it. I'm happy to get in touch. Um, I mean, I don't know what exactly you do with the Jupyter app, but uh, of course here uh, there's, when I just took the, my native understanding, so my, my previous experience with Jupyter app, you of course have to install the Jupyter hub in a certain your infrastructure, um, which is then not something that the scientist could do by himself in that sense. So this would have been done through the IT department of the research center or so on. And the idea here is also to basically when I have, like I want to give just one colleague access to my simple um, module, I just send him, uh, I just open up this tunnel, right? And then tell the colleague, hey, here's how you can call my function on my server and get access to my data, right? So it's a, it's a more, it's a less technical because it's a very lightweight API in that sense. So there are no, diff no hardcore dependencies here involved. No, yes, that sounds good. I think that it is that sort of, we don't want to scare people with being like, you need to use Jupyter, you need to do, you know, these technologies, it needs to be seamless, as you say. So yeah, it's those kind of problems you need to, you know, you need to overcome really. So yeah, that sounds really good. 
Um, there's another question in the chat from uh, Sven van der Boer. Um, do you want to uh, unmute yourself or? Yeah, sure. Um, so I I'm not sure if this is really like something you plan to do, but how, how do you sort of prevent users from submitting malicious code, right? So basically anything will run on the remote if they submit it. Or, and if this is not something you worry about, why don't you just give give people access? Um, well, we can, I mean, that's, that's always a bit of a question, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we can give access to uh, our, so usually research centers just can't give access to servers or so on for other researchers or uh, external people, they have to sign forms or uh, have to be acknowledged for a different, for a certain project or so So it's a pretty administrative um, task. Um, when we, so that's why I cannot just give them access. Um, how we plan to prevent users from submitting malicious code. Well, I mean, first of all, we don't run code in that sense, right? So the backend module developer is responsible for what he is doing. Also the backend module runs under his client. And of course, this framework opens a door to the server. I mean, and then it's actually the responsibility of the backend developer to make it safe. I mean, if it's just for a simple function that computes the sum over a array or so on, it's quite simple, right? So there are no real security leaks in that sense. Um, but that's what I also mean with the user management for the backend module, for instance, that you can only like allow certain people to access it. And um, you can also, uh, you could also go in the Pulsar here and uh, try to use their in a, um, token authentication to make sure that this is not um, misused. But yeah, there we definitely need to put more effort into it. And I also see this as a challenging problem for our IT. But in the end, it's a just a way for analysis. So it's not the aim. I mean, it's I mean, you could do this without our framework, right? You can, I mean, all these technologies exist. So you can do this without our framework. We make it a bit easier, of course. But if you um, want to make, if you open that door for others, then it's actually, and the IT doesn't want to have this, then it's actually the job of the IT department to um, circumvent these kind of processes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. F for the rest, it's a good night presentation. <laughs> thank you. So uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, if I look on the timetable, uh, I think we have to move on. Um, so okay, yeah, we'll answer the remaining questions in the chat. Yeah. Ah, then I will. So we start with the next talk. Uh, here we are. Uh, it's again, um, it's presented by Ronald Visa about little minions in archaeology and open source space for RSE software and small grids in digital archaeology. The floor is yours. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, can you see the presentation now? Perfect, world. Okay, good. Because I can't see what I'm sharing. I don't like Zoom, but we have to make with it. Um, so Little Minions in Archaeology. Um, it's a joint project cooperation uh, between uh, Florian Thierry and Moritz Menninga and myself. Uh, we've been doing it for a couple of years already. Um, 
Uh, what are minions? Uh, minions are little yellow uh, animals. What do you call them? No. Um, we thought them as uh, little helpers, uh, little small um, uh, scripts, little homegrown applications, anything that helps archaeologists to uh, make their work easier. Um, minions often just the workload, make things easier. Uh, but one of the things that are very strange with minions, uh, they're rarely presented um, in, into the research community. We tend to use them, uh, uh, get very much use of them, but don't share them with others. Uh, generally, one uh, tends to focus on presenting the results um, and, and don't share these minions with others. Um, and also we see that in archaeology research, software is often underrepresented in conference talks and in publications because they're quite small, often too small to share. Um, so we decided to promote little minions in the research, uh, software engineering and domain specific research to make us more visible. Um, we, we created this as kind of working group at the Computer Applications and Quantitative Methods and Archaeology Conference. What started out with a small session, uh, and it tends to be something in each CAA conference over the last couple of years. And, uh, people tend to expect minions at the CAA as well. And so I think we're stuck with minions at the CAA for a couple of years to come. Um, these, these human helpers, uh, well, in, in our case, uh, Moritz, Florian, and me, uh, we organize a session uh, to focus on these little minions and invite researchers to share their little helpers so that they also benefit the wider scientific community. Um, in such a minion session, we, we focus on really short, simple talks uh, and anything is possible. Um, it explains the character and how the tool is used. Um, and what we feel that is important that all the tools that are used are at least open, uh, especially open source, uh, prepare, preferably open science, uh, but at least that it's clear what people have done. Um, our aim is that all little minions are non-proprietary uh, and open source, uh, but, but sometimes we notice that it's not possible yet, uh, but our aim is that all these things will be shared on GitHub, GitLab, or whatever open platform. Um, just to give you an idea, some little minions from the last CAA conferences. Um, last year, there was no CAA conference due to the obvious COVID reasons. The next conference will be an online one um, between 14th and 18th of June um, this year. It uh, will be online. And there will be a minion session and the deadline has been extended. So if you have a minion, don't hesitate to send them in for the session. Um, some examples of the last uh, couple of years. Uh, Martina Trocknitz presented in 2019 uh, in Krakow. There was a linked open bibli bibliography for the Bronze Age. Um, she showed how she used various open tools to share sources for uh, the Bronze Age. Um, myself, I presented a little text mining minion. Uh, we used to analyze a lot of archaeological reports by using text mining to prevent uh, having to read all the documents ourselves and only select the useful, uh, the useful documents. Um, Florian uh, presented uh, a tool to extract academic metadata uh, from Oh, yeah, help me out. Um, I I'm, I'm seem to have stuck what I, I know this tool, I remember it, but I can't really explain what it's about. So maybe Florian will explain it later. Um, and Fanette Gutlich uh, presented something on how to do low cost 3D pottery documentation on site, make it uh, cheap, simple uh, by using open tools. All, uh, 
presentations are available with YouTube links. You can download them uh, or watch them online. And last but not least, Moritz Menninga uh, presented uh, a small tool to create profiles, vertical profiles of archaeological digs in GIS and do that as simple and as automatic as possible. And he presented that in 2018 and 19. Um, so, what have we learned and what can you do with these minions? Um, well, the most important thing is that it's important to present also the software you've used to increase the understanding of the digital processes, but also make it open, transparent. Um, short lightning talks uh, and what we've added. Um, in the beginning, it was kind of an accident. Uh, a lot of papers, a lot of presenters were not, not present. And then we asked, are there anyone who want to do a spontaneous talk? Um, and that was quite a success. So we decided to add that part always to the session. So during the session, there's always someone who, there's always time for people to present their minion uh, spontaneous or prepared. Uh, but there's also open space if anything pops up show us and it creates a nice dynamic and casual atmosphere where we can have nice discussions and there's a nice sharing of knowledge and, and software. So what can you do? Create your own little minion session. It's an open format and, and we would like to see the little minions in all domains uh, on all scientific conferences and, and that little minions become something that's logical to share and easy to share. Thank you uh, for this, for your attention and time for questions. Thank you very much, Ronald. Are there any questions? So, no question, but that's a really nice idea. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so then, um, I'll share my screen again. Um, thank you very much again. And thank you all the participants and especially the speakers uh, for your presentation. I know I'm thanking myself, but anyway. Um, so again, here's the list of the upcoming events. Um, I will also send you a small thank you email with a link to a survey. Um, and it would be very good for us and also for the future of organizers of events like this. Uh, if you could give us a, big, a quick feedback how you thought how everything worked today. Thank you very much. Then. I will end this session here. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Thank you.